using quite a bit of RF energy. But the effects would happen away from the equipment. That could happen outside. All right. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm going to sit here and watch as I speak to you your first video, the first video that uh, uh, Keith. I think you sent him what? You sent him videotape. Um, those video t or TV shows and videotape. Okay. Sure. This uh, shows objects, solid objects of all kinds, mm -hmm. just suddenly taking a, a off from the floor and from shelves it shows a, a plastic bottle squeezing in all by itself it shows my god object after object just taking off from the floor now mm -hmm. um that'd be 1987 time period when i was at peak 88 um to 89 time period when i was at peak efficiency with this stuff and what in god's name are we seeing here i mean where was <laughs> where was this Please. Uh, this was in another laboratory in Vancouver, Canada. Yes. And it was sponsored by Boeing, the Boeing Company down in Seattle, Washington. Boeing, yes. And with also a couple of workers, um, the scientists that worked with me. We set this laboratory up yet again. It went through many different moves prior to that. And on this run, um, I incorporated uh, microwave technology and more advanced Tesla systems and also more advanced electrostatic systems. Yeah, but my God, whatever you would throw at these things, um, I can understand little pieces of tin or foil or something jumping around with great electrostatic uh, uh, prodding, but you know, mm -hmm. nothing's taking off into the air like this, John. Oh, I know. We're up to 1,500 pounds. Oh, really? That only levitated, though, one inch. Now, the idea, and there's, I have a lot of scientific papers written by other scientists, but there appears that these um, are like uh, keyways that open up some other dimension to allow this to happen. Well, okay, but again, what we're seeing here is so fantastic. I mean, after all, a wrench, for example, a solid metal wrench uh, at the beginning of this video just takes off and flies up out of camera range. Where did these, what kind of, was this a chamber or where was this? Well, this particular location... There was many different other locations, but this one was in a sub-basement of a large building. Okay. And um, we were trying to find target areas, and we found this particular target area to be extremely um, active. So I was holding a camera with, and actually kind of scared, too, because you know where these things are going to land. Well, yeah, I was going to ask <laughs> take, take the wrench, for example. This thing takes off and just flies straight up. Now, where did it go? That sometimes the samples would hit the beans on top and bounce off onto another angle onto the floor, or they would simply, it appears that the movement of the earth has something to do with the slight slant movement of these things. Right. And they just go into the, um, another storage bin um, next to that storage area there. <sighs> that was pretty impressive, I think. Yeah, for, no, not time. pretty impressive. It's really, 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 really impressive. Uh, you were and and you were using that same setup, or what were you using to cause what we're seeing here? I was using a lot more equipment than I was back in the early eighties. Um, but but I, can you can you describe specifically what you were doing, or do you not wish to? Oh, I don't mind at all. Okay, describe then exactly <laughs> technically what you were doing in case somebody wants to try and duplicate this. Well, I had a lot of equipments running at that time, and I'd set the the units on. Once I got them tuned up, there's a lot of heat, and that with all these things, and they sort of drift, and you have to keep adjusting them until you start getting effects. Right. So in this particular case, um, I had some friends there, a fellow from Germany actually, holding the camera one time while I was doing this. Actually, the German government got involved in this stuff, too, in 89, 90. Um, and then I'd hold the camera, and he'd keep an eye on the lab so there'd be no spontaneous fires coming out of the walls or concrete, which is recorded. <laughs> I know it sounds wild. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, with what's happening oh, here, I, I would be very concerned about other things happening. Yeah. But, again, uh, what I'm asking for is technically what, were you, what did you have on to produce this effect? At this particular time, I went very big with the lab instead of only uh, four thousand watts 110 volts is up to close to uh, 3,000 watts 110 volts input into all the equipments 
I had um, the one million volt um, Tesla coil running. Okay. The uh, two million volt electrostatic unit I made running at that time, along with the half a million volt electrostatic unit with Van de Graaff generators. Okay. I had a unit called, which helped a lot, called simply its army surplus, called Device 17 by 15. It's a, a radar, programmable radar system for counter intelligence and countermeasures, radar systems. Yes. We just put out uh, X-band radar at, oh, maybe mm, roughly 10 to, as I recall, 100 milliwatts. Okay. And that was focused into the field. And I had also um, a pulsating magnetron, a mechanically pulsed magnetron. Good Lord, you had a whole <laughs> soup of things, electromagnetic and uh, otherwise, going on in there. Quite a bit. I had at least in um, equipment weight from that time period by the moving company, 22 tons of stuff. Well, that's... 22 tons? 22 tons. That, I peaked up at that level, had so many different... Other, also other experiments running too. John, if I if I might ask, equipment of this magnitude would take some amount of financing to put together. That it would. Now, if you're to, to buy these things off the shelf, you'd be running into many many millions. Right. However, in Canada, there is many uh, scrap yards, surplus yards, where it seemed the stuff came to me. I'd go to one place called Convoy Electrical Machinery, and there I found almost an exact duplicate of the. Uh, Colorado Springs Tesla Transformer Westinghouse 56 KVA. Right. And basically, they didn't want it, and they said they'd deliver it. They wanted to get rid of it. So, <laughs> and over and over again, I set up a network where people told me, saying, well, we got a Siemens Transformer DC voltage, um, 200,000 volts. So you people know. liked what you were doing, in other words, and as they heard about it, they made donations. They made donations. Of stuff. Basically, yeah, they... they gave stuff and sometimes would have to purchase stuff, but it was dirt cheap. We had so much uh, army surplus, so much um, other types of surplus, and the old wire, even back 100 years ago, let's say, was available in the scrapyards. Nobody wanted it except me. Except you. All right. <laughs> hold, hold on, John. Hold it right there. You've got to see this, folks. To my website, artbell.com, to program tonight's guest info and the videos. Um, seeing is believing. I'm Art Bell. Back now to John Hutchinson. And, uh, John, uh, it says here that uh, your effect has been very well documented and seen many times by credentialed scientists and engineers. Now, mm -hmm. if, uh, if a credentialed scientist or engineer were to actually witness what I'm seeing on videotape, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'd be I'd be real curious what they'd have to say. Oh, they get very excited. They get extremely excited. <laughs> and right, and I mean, uh, yeah, and 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 say what? I mean, uh, surely their scientific minds. Well, they just go wild. They want to get funding to to put this into a more controlled laboratory situation. There's reports written about it, and like people from Donald Douglas or from Boeing or from other national laboratories. Um, they want to see it go. But I guess perhaps the, the effects are so dramatic, so astounding in some ways, that um, a lot of the funding, of course, would be turned down. It says metal samples turn transparent. You mean like steel? What kind of metal? Um, I don't know exactly because I let the scientific teams analyze everything because I'd be too busy operating the equipment. Uh, so you were operating the equipment, producing the effect, and they were examining the results. They were examining the results and filming the results. Metals turn to jelly. Mm-hmm. What do you know about that? Anything? Well, well, I do know that there's some unique, very exotic subatomic structures that I feel that would perhaps allow this to decouple. I, be I actually believe in gravitons and chronons, time particles, and many other subatomic particles. And also believe that there's an amazing amount of energy out there that if it's triggered or tickled or tweaked. And that's what you think you're doing? That's what I think I'm doing. Now, the results have been duplicated a tiny bit by a friend and well-respected scientist Ken Shoulders and well-respected scientist Richard Hall on the invisibility factor. In 